antipsychotic medications are split into two broad categories, the typical and atypical antipsychotics. The main difference is that typical antipsychotics are much more likely to cause extrapyramidal symptoms, but we are going to cover the other differences too, as well as their uses and their side effects. Since they're mentioned a lot, the extrapyramidal side effects are movement disorders such as dystonia, where there are continuous spasms and muscle contractions, akathisia, which is restlessness, Parkinsonism signs such as rigidity, bradykinesia, which is the slowing of movements, as well as tardive dyskinesia, which is where the patient has irregular jerky movements, often in the lower face and distal extremities, and can be chronic. The first thing we need to know is how this class of drugs works. Both typical and atypical antipsychotics block dopaminergic signaling in the CNS. Specifically, they are type 2 dopamine receptor antagonists, or D2 receptor antagonists. There are six main dopamine signaling pathways in the brain, but the four most involved with antipsychotics are the mesocortical, which is associated with negative symptoms of schizophrenia, the mesolimbic, which is involved with the positive symptoms of schizophrenia, the nigrostriatal pathway, the one that is associated with motor planning and dopaminergic signaling within it leads to purposeful movement. The extrapyramidal symptoms associated with antipsychotics come from blockage of this pathway. You may also have heard of this pathway before, as it is the pathway affected mostly in Parkinson's disease. The fourth is the tuberoinfundibular pathway, which releases dopamine that inhibits prolactin release from the pituitary gland. First, let's take a look at the typical antipsychotics. Examples include haloperiodol, flufenazine, trifluoperazine, chlorpromazine, and thioridazine. Some of these have a very high potency, such as haloperiodol, flufenazine, and trifluoperazine, and therefore lead to a large blockage, while chlorpromazine and thioridazine are lower potency D2 receptor antagonists. Antipsychotic drugs are primarily lipophilic and have a 20 to 40 hour half-life. The clinical uses of the typical antipsychotics can include schizophrenia, more so against the positive symptoms like delusions and hallucinations, rather than the negative symptoms like a flat affect. They're also used against psychotic mania in bipolar disorder, major depressive disorder psychosis, delirium, as well as psychosis in Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. For the side effects, we have things like antimuscarinic effects like dry mouth, constipation, blurred vision, and urinary retention, which occur more commonly in the lower potency antipsychotics than in the high potency. We also have alpha-1 receptor antagonism, which may lead to orthostatic hypotension, again more commonly in the low potency than the high potency. And next, we have histamine H1 receptor antagonism, again more common in the low than in the high potency, which can lead to weight gain and sedation. Then of course, from the D2 receptor blocking in the nigrostriatal pathway, we have extrapyramidal symptoms, this time more so in the high potency antipsychotics than in the low ones. These symptoms include dystonia and akathisia, which are typically within days, Parkinsonism, which is usually seen within weeks, and over months they may develop tardive dyskinesia. Then we have blockage of the D2 receptors in the tuberoinfundibular pathway, which again is more common in the high potency than in the low potency. This can lead to hyperprolactinemia, giving galactorrhea, breast soreness and amenorrhea in females, while giving impotence and a decreased libido in males. Next, we have neuroleptic malignant syndrome, which is a life-threatening reaction to the antipsychotics, again seen more commonly in the higher potency medications. It is characterized by fever, altered mental status, muscle rigidity, and autonomic dysfunction. Other side effects include the torsades arrhythmia, seizures, as well as corneal and retinal deposits, with chlorpromazine and thioridazine respectively. Now for the atypical or second generation antipsychotics. Examples include quetiapine, olanzapine, risperidone, aripiprazole, clozapine, and ziprazidone. Like the typical antipsychotics, these also bind and antagonize the D2 receptors in the CNS, but are much weaker in this effect. Instead, they have a strong effect on binding and blocking serotonin receptors, specifically the 5H2-2A receptors, 
and so it is thought that they better modulate the serotonin-dopamine balance. Clinical indications include schizophrenia, because they work against the positive and the negative symptoms, and they're also used as an adjunctive therapy for depression, as well as having uses in things like OCD. The side effects associated with atypical antipsychotics include sedation due to antagonism of the histamine 1 receptor, orthostatic hypotension due to alpha 1 receptor antagonism, as well as anti-muscarinic side effects like the dry mouth, constipation, blurry vision and urinary retention that we mentioned previously. Additionally, atypical antipsychotics often feature more metabolic side effects like weight gain, dyslipidemia and hyperglycemia. Clozapine in particular has a risk of neutropenia or agranulocytosis, so frequent blood tests are required. Clozapine also decreases the seizure threshold and has a risk of myocarditis. Extrapyramidal side effects are way less common in atypical antipsychotics, but are still possible just like neuroleptic malignant syndrome. They also have a risk of the torsades arrhythmia.